Well, thank you very much, Dean Heath. I just really appreciate this. And Co Colleen, thank you as well. Nothing could be a greater honor than to be here and recognize and honor my friends and colleagues, Karen Sexton and Diana Weaver. Karen was a dear friend and a dear colleague for really most of my career. Someone I learned a great deal from, uh, a true role model, and Diana still is. And we're just so grateful that we have um, had the opportunity to know Karen and to enjoy and celebrate our work with Diana. So this is really an honor for me, and I appreciate it very much, and very much appreciate all of you taking time out of your day in the middle of the day to come and join as we have a bit of a discussion together. I will share with you, I've already gotten two UK buttons. The first, <laughs> the first one says, nurses love cats. I, I think it says, go cats, but I'm looking at it upside down. And the other is the College of Nursing uh, pin. And so I feel quite, quite special and quite honored to be able to wear those in front of you today. So what I'd like to do today during our time together is just to talk a little bit about the inspiration that I've gotten from uh, Karen and from Diana. The uh, planning committee asked me in particular to talk about the challenges that I have ex experienced in various leadership capacities. And I can't think about challenges without thinking about opportunities, and thus I've uh, entitled the remarks, Big Challenges, Big Opportunities. But there was a wonderful paper um, published not too long ago um, about Karen. Uh, it was actually a wonderful interview that Karen Hall had, or Karen Hill, excuse me, had with uh, with Karen, and very special. And in published in the Journal of Nursing Administration. And so I want to talk about that in just a moment. But in looking uh, for material related to Karen Karen's uh, career, one of the things she said that kind of uh, forms the thread that I'll carry throughout my remarks was this. In describing the implementation of the disaster plan at UTMB in the wake of Hurricane Rita in 2005, she said, it was like an orchestra. All the musicians were doing their part. And that suggests a couple of things to me that I'll follow up on regarding preparation for the work and the way we see the, our ability to do the uh, work and envision the possibilities in front of us. And as best I can tell, Karen led that hospital system through two hurricanes, Hurricane Rita in 2005 and Hurricane Ike in 2008. As a matter of fact, one of our um, associate deans was at UTMB at the time, and I asked her about it, and she talked about how effective Karen was. So I went back to the... Um, the paper that Karen Hill had authored and tried to distill the lessons that, that I might learn and that I might share with you from Karen Sexton. And that is, learn from others, but be flexible in the process. Don't second guess yourself. Now she didn't suggest that we adhere to a decision uh, when another decision might be preferable, but she just said, don't, don't spend a lot of time on angst. Don't second guess. Move forward and keep moving uh, as a leader and learn from mistakes as we go forward. So the goals that I have for our comments, uh, our discussion together today are three. First, I'd love to take a few minutes to reflect with you on a couple of principles, uh, key principles for me at least, on leadership challenges and opportunities. And then I've chosen one of those experiences in my career that I've been so fortunate to have, and I'd like to share that with you. Uh, the chancellor with whom I'm working right now talks about these as big rocks. Maybe you've heard the big rock analogy, um, and the idea is that when you really want to accomplish things, you fill a jar first with the big rocks, and then you pour in the sand and the pebbles. So I'm going to share a big rock with you today. And then I'd like to end by providing a little bird's eye view of the work that we are doing in Nebraska that is so exciting and so much fun for me and uh, will be a lot of fun to share. So the two foundational principles that I'd really like to reflect with you about are preparation and um, perception. 
So to me, preparation uh, really refers to being ready for leadership. And I think that in nursing, those of us who are in nursing and who are in health professions in any way have had the opportunity for preparation that is beyond compare. We really are ready at any level to step up to leadership, formal or informal. Um, one of the uh, principles that informs my way of thinking about this came from uh, Rudy Giuliani, who published a book not too long after the 9-11 experience, a book entitled Leadership. And one of his uh, comments was that as we think about leadership, we all need to engage in relentless preparation. It's such a telling phrase, relentless preparation. So I, I would say that I think that in nursing, we do go through relentless preparation for meeting needs of others, for uh, viewing what might be possible, what we can add to the quality of health and the quality of health care going forward. And that leads to our ability to perceive our opportunities truly as a glass half full. A rather tired metaphor, perhaps, but it's very, very telling. So I have a story to tell you to start with to talk about preparation. And this is a story from my current environment. Um, you know that the University of Nebraska Medical Center, along with Emory University in particular, um, treated patients with um, Ebola uh, over the last couple of years, and particularly in fall of 2014, then, then ultimately Bellevue uh, Medical Center in New York City. In our situation at the University of Nebraska Medical Center, we, uh, we really got into this in an interesting way. We have, have and had at the time a 10-bed biocontainment unit. It turns out it's the largest biocontainment unit in the country. I don't think we knew that when we built it, and I don't think we really intended that, but it is the largest biocontainment unit in the country. And we have a biocontainment team that was practicing relentlessly, preparing relentlessly for those 10 years. One of the team members is one of our faculty, and you see her here um, gowned and gloved and ready to go, actually. She was doing a training session when this photo was made. And the interesting thing is this team was preparing, 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 and they were getting a little bit of buzz about I mean, really, biocontainment, has that kind of gone away? Do we need to worry about that anymore? Uh, not so sure that this is really important. And we'd spent a lot of money as a university uh, developing this biocontainment unit. So you can kind of imagine the little bit of skepticism starting to creep in. In our College of Nursing, we have some internal grant money from our system for a program that is known as HEROES. And HEROES is an acronym that stands for Healthcare Emergency Responder Organization Education Through Simulation. We've had this funding for a long time, since uh, 2003. And in a sense, it's recurring guaranteed money. On the other hand, we provide annual reports every year, which suggests that if we don't do a good job, it could go away. So the, the uh, year before the dreadful Ebola pandemic, uh, I was talking with this faculty member and with the staff who were part of this HEROES program, and I said, you know, I'm not hearing people talk as much about this, and I don't think a lot of people in the university are really aware of what you're doing, and so I'd like for you to do me a favor and put some marketing together and get your story out there and make sure people know what you're doing. Then they did a beautiful job. They did a wonderful job. As it turns out, they didn't need to have done that. Um, but it seemed appropriate in 2013. In 2014, after we started accepting patients, uh, well, I will tell you, as of earlier this week, our chancellor shared with us, we've had 1.5 billion media hits uh, related to the work that we're doing in that biocontainment bio unit. And this faculty member now is um, uh, doctorally prepared and assistant professor on two major grants and really just doing some wonderful things. Uh, and that's partly because along with Emory and uh, Bellevue Medical Center, we've been named one of uh, three providers in the National Ebola Training and Education Center. So it's really, um, I think, a great example, one of the best I know about the value of preparation and being committed to a vision, being committed to a goal. This faculty member, Beth Beam, along with one of our alums who leads the biocontainment unit, uh, Shelley Schwedhelm, had a paper published in uh, Nursing Outlook in January, a special issue in January of 2015, describing the preparation and describing the teamwork. And I like to sing their praises 
those is because I think it exemplifies what we're really what I'm thinking about. The other example about uh, preparation that I'd like to share with you is one that I heard fairly recently on the NPR TED Radio Hour, one of my favorite things to listen to. This um, interview was with a physician by the name of Ken Kamler, who himself has a TED presentation. Perhaps some of you have seen it. And the uh, TED presentation he did on TED Med in 2009 is called Medical Miracle on Everest. And the story just basically goes like this, that he himself is a climber, but he was the, the um, physician for the climbs, and um, with a number of other clinicians as well. And the, there were a number of climbers on Mount Everest trying to ascend to the top of, of the uh, mountain, and the weather worsened. Unexpectedly, the weather became bad, and in fact, it just dramatically deteriorated. He himself had to retreat pretty quickly down the mountain to a place where he actually had medical supplies available, and very quickly, climbers began, began he said, stumbling into his medical tent uh, in very bad shape, actually, from the cold, from injuries, from uh, all of the exposure that they had had to that quickly deteriorating storm and weather system. And so the interviewer on NPR asked him what they did. How did they cope with that? How did they address this issue of suddenly being in this rather unexpected and really high-pressure situation? And he said, we just did what we were prepared to do. We didn't spend a lot of time worrying about it. We did what we had prepared for. And I thought, this is truly an example of we have those skills as nurses, as health professionals, to step up, not just in crisis, but at any point in time. The second fundamental principle that I'd like to talk a little bit about is that of perception. Predominantly, our perception, our beliefs as nurses, as health professionals, as leaders of what is possible at any moment in time. So at our university, we have recently undergone some um, intensive consulting on what is being called breakthrough thinking by a group known as GAP International, and maybe you know of GAP International. Uh, but breakthrough thinking is premised on the belief that we can accomplish what we believe we can accomplish. It's premised on the idea that if we believe something is possible, you know, we're not going to be delusional and assume that it will just happen the next day, but we can in fact put together an execution plan that will make it likely that we will achieve that. And so in our university, we um, actually changed our mission statement entirely, but we changed it based on um, a stand that we wrote as part of all of that consultation. And the stand was our declarative statement, not of what will be, but what is. Our declarative statement of what we believe our role actually is as a medical center, as a health science center in um, quality for the future. And the concept of a stand for a dream, what we would call a dream, a vision, a reimagined future, you know all the language that we all use, but a stand that this is, this is the case, this is what we're about, this is what we will do, I think made an impact on all of us and really caused us to question to what extent are our perceptions oriented toward what might be what we might believe is possible and what we might believe we can make happen versus what we might be um, afraid of in terms of risks and mitigation and so forth. So to me, it's all about the power of those perceptions, the, the power of our assumptions about what's possible going forward. So for example, uh, in this uh, little animated um, situation, are we crossing to the other side or are we afraid for our lives? You know, it's all about how we see what the future might bring to, to mind. So as I thought about challenges and opportunities, I kept thinking, you know, some challenges are problems. Some challenges are crises. Some challenges, we would say, are opportunities. And sometimes in a sort of management speak, don't we occasionally say, oh, we have a new opportunity for improvement? <laughs> we all have lots of opportunities for improvement every day. We truly do. Um, but as I started to think about it, I think we could really think about 
uh, at least a two-dimensional, if not a three-dimensional matrix in which we think through what those uh, challenges and opportunities might look like and how we might respond. So, for example, in the lower left um, uh, quadrant of this diagram, where we have the situation with low challenge and low opportunity, I would ask myself, is this just business as usual? Is this a tactical a set of tactical uh, opportunities for us? How much time and energy do we put on it, or do we create a system solution that makes it run somewhat on autopilot? In the uh, lower right quadrant, low challenge and um, high opportunity, this seems to me to be a case where we would find low-hanging fruit, and I personally love low-hanging fruit. I love to have a success, go for it, get it done, show what can happen, and then move on to something that's more challenging than that, but really uh, create confidence by accomplishing something. In the top left quadrant, where we have a case of low challenge and high opportunity, or, excuse me, do I have that right? Let's see, low challenge and high opportunity, no, I've got, the, I've got this reversed. Low challenge, low opportunity, there we go. Low opportunity and high challenge, uh, which is actually, actually the lower right. But that would be something I would stay away from. Low opportunity, high challenge, I mean, who needs it? Really? You know? <laughs> and finally, obviously, in the uh, top right quadrant, high challenge and high opportunity. I think this is what we aim for in any leadership role, uh, where we know that we need to dedicate courage, we need to assess and manage, maybe mitigate risk, and we need to use leadership to move forward. One of uh, the, the um, books, one of the individuals who's made uh, the most impact on my thinking about leadership is a faculty member at Harvard by the name of Ron Heifetz. And I was fortunate enough some years ago to attend a, um, a two, I think it was a two week training session at, uh, at it was actually at, the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard, where um, Heifetz is on faculty. And the focus there was on adaptive leadership. Now, Heifetz has written several books with colleagues. The one that I find to be the most compelling, and it actually sounds a little bit, um, a little bit negative, but the title is Leadership on the Line, Staying Alive Through the La Dangers of Leadership. Well, I don't really see it that way, but that's the title. And um, Heifetz's central hypothesis is that the thing that we should all be thinking about in any leadership capacity, whether it's formal or not, is what is the adaptive leadership challenge? Or are we in fact dealing more with technical challenges? He describes technical challenges as those things that you might look at uh, what I'm describing here as perhaps high challenge, low opportunity. You know, something that requires a quick fix you know, not anything that's a big deal, basically problem solving. Whereas adaptive challenges and adaptive leader involve working on those big intractable problems that are going to take a while to really address. And he comments in some of his work, in fact, he has a recent um, TED Ed uh, talk out about this. He comments that something that's adaptive really calls upon each of us to create a space for ourselves and the people that we work with that is a safe space, that is a supportive, emotionally supportive space because we're gonna be in this for the long haul. We're working together on a challenging issue, like healthcare, for example, or uh, I'll share some other examples. But we'll be in it for the long haul and we need to keep ourselves refreshed and moving forward. So having talked in some generalities, I'd like to share with you a little bit about my own um, situation. So some of my challenges as I've looked over my career have included uh, initially earning my doctorate, which actually was really quite a momentous thing for me. It really was very uh, much of a growth experience. It, um, it really helped me move forward and think about what the future might look like, and it was a tremendous experience that I enjoyed enormously. But then I'd like to talk about, in particular, uh, the opportunities of moving into academic administration, which I have felt, for me, was the best of all worlds, the opportunity to make a lot of difference in so many different ways. And then, as well as that, um, the opportunities that I've had to engage in national leadership service. So I'd like to stop there just for a moment and say that those opportunities actually began when I was very early in my career. And I happened to be serving as the vice president for the University of Kentucky chapter of, the, of Sigma Theta Tau International, the international, it, wasn't, it was the National Honor Society at the time. 
And someone came to me and said, we are so glad you won this election and you're vice president for our chapter now. And did anyone tell you <laughs> that that means you're the program planning chair? And the other little detail is that we are planning a regional program and it really needs to be perfect because you know, <laughs> Kentucky, we want Kentucky on the map. This needs to be perfect. And I thought, oh my gosh, what have I gotten into? So I put everything I had into that regional uh, conference. And we pulled a great team together. The team did a fabulous job. Some of you were here at the time. It was a wonderful experience. And it just energized me about the opportunities that were possible on um, both the local scale and then the bigger scale and what that might mean. But the challenge and the opportunity that I'd really like to spend most of my time talking about today that stretched me the most was being part of the national work to advance the idea, this belief, this vision or dream of the doctor of nursing practice and academic nursing. I've always been concerned throughout my career with how to more fully link ac the academic nursing enterprise with the clinical nursing enterprise. I think that's where we get we get fireworks, we get, we get great things um, that really cause us to move forward. And it's been so exciting to me to have some opportunities to work with others in this area. So I'd like to share a little bit more with you about that, particularly starting with the doctor of nursing practice. This was an idea. This was one of those perceptions where we take a stand, where we absolutely take a stand. Uh, in the mid-90s, the dean I worked with here, uh, Dr. Carolyn Williams, who's here with us today in the audience, um, started talking with the faculty about the need for advanced leadership in clinical practice and what might we do in order to create some academic opportunities for nurses who were interested in advanced leadership in clinical practice. And this idea was debated, talked about. Again, many of you were here at the time. I'm surprised when I talk with our own DNP students that um, well, I think they think it's unusual to have somebody talk about history, for one thing. <laughs> but, um, but they don't always know this. And I think the back story is always the, the good story. So the idea was really developed here at the University of Kentucky in the late 1990s, and it was approved by the UK Board of Trustees in 2000. Very controversial. And there's still some controversy, but very controversial at the time. Um, the program did not open until the following fall, 2001. Uh, Dr. Stanhope, Marcia Stanhope, who's here today as well, and I had the privilege of co-directing that program. Now, there was a gap in time, 2000 to 2001, and um, the, Dr. Williams had decided to deliberately wait to open the program to make sure we had everything organized so this would be a quality program. This was on the edge. This was truly on the edge, and we wanted to be sure that we could do a great job with this. This was a case of something that was high risk, high uncertainty, but high potential payoff. And none of us knew, and there was a lot of opposition. Some of the concerns that were voiced around the country and that we still hear today included concerns about diverting potential students from PhD programs, diminishing the development of nursing science, creating pressure on already scarce faculty resources, worry that employers might not really hire the graduates, and worry that employers might not be able to pay the graduates at doctoral levels, and worries about potentially reducing the rigor of doctoral education. And if you look at the literature from 2001 till now, you'll see lots of papers about that, lots of good, healthy debate about those issues. So as a group nationally, and I'm going to go back and forth between what was happening here at UK and what was happening nationally, we just decided we had to go for it. And at UK, we'd already put the stake in the ground that we thought this was important and we thought we could address those concerns in a thoughtful, responsible way. Because in academic nursing, we need science and we need practice to create the better future. At the time that this idea was developing in Kentucky, it was also, it actually something similar it had also emerged at the University of Tennessee at Memphis, the Health Science Center at Memphis, which had developed a new type of clinical doctorate using the DNSC um, 
uh, academic degree, and that was, as I understand it, based in part on requirements from the Tennessee um, State Higher Education Board. The University of South Carolina had also opened a similar program, and they were awarding an ND. But we were calling these sort of second, maybe third generation practice doctoral programs because they looked different than earlier generations. At that time, in 2001, um, a variety of types of nurse doctorate ND programs were already being offered at Case Western, at the University of Colorado, at the University of Rochester, and at Rush University. At two of those uh, universities, the degree was an entry-level degree, so they varied pretty substantially. So how did this actually work? Well, in terms of preparation, both locally and then in the national dialogue, those of us who were working on it had facts. We had lots of information about trends in healthcare and what we thought would be necessary. And that leads to the second thing we had, a lot of opinions. We, we knew we were right. <laughs> we were willing to listen, but we were pretty sure we were on the right path. And um, that's not to say that the path didn't veer a little bit from time to time, but there really was a sense of this is important, the time is now, we must do this, we must, again, responsibly address the concerns and go forward. Here in Kentucky, we completed a survey of potential employers that no one had done, and that was used actually in the position paper out of AACN. Uh, through AACN, we, meaning a huge group of people that I just had the privilege of being part of, not leading, um, engage all kinds of stakeholders, in nursing, outside of nursing, in business and industry, you name it. We had a variety of people weighing in on this, and it was like sort of a piece of clay. You know, you just keep trying to shape it a little bit. And then nationally, ultimately, we developed a position statement and the essentials that we talked, uh, that you heard about. So I'll give you one example of how important it was for all of us involved in this to listen to everything people were saying to us. In um, 2004, AACN had asked me if I would present, if I'd be part of a panel, a pro and con, so you know automatically that's going to be a, a, an interesting panel, um, at the New York Nurse Practitioners Association. The deans were all in session at the October AACN meeting. And so I was um, someone who was not a dean at the time and could speak about it. So I did. I went to New York um, uh, near... Um, Oh, gosh, I've forgotten the name of the beautiful lake up there, Lake George, Lake George. It was a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful session. And the, the humorous part of the story is that the conference was being held in a separate building from the rooms, the sleeping rooms. And the weather, this is another weather story, the weather got bad overnight, and the, um, all of the power went out. And the session was scheduled for 7.30 in the morning, which is a problem to start with, I would just tell you. But... <laughs> But the power was completely out. My room was completely pitch black, dark. And so I thought, well, we won't have the session. I mean, it's just a shame. We'll have to reschedule. Someone called me and said, oh, no, no, we're having the session. And we have generator power in the other building. Come to the session. Well, you can imagine trying to get ready in pitch black. It was really interesting. But I got to the session, and everything was sort of half power because it, the generator was off. And the coffee was kind of half coffee. And the people in the room were not in a good mood. <laughs> And um, so it didn't really start out the best, but we had a wonderful conversation. And it turns out that one of the issues that group was concerned about was the fact that uh, regulations, in, Medicare regulations specified that to be reimbursed, nurse practitioners had to have master's degrees. And we were proposing something different. Well, obviously, that had to be fixed. That had to be fixed, and it was. AACN fixed it. But one of the things that it taught me was how important it was to understand what other people are concerned with and to continue to address those issues, again, uh, thoroughly and responsibly. Now, there's a nice description of this entire process, actually in a book that um, Lisa Chisholm published in 2010 that maybe you're using in your DNP program called The Doctor of Nursing Practice, a guidebook for role development and professional issues. And there's an interview with Dr. Williams, which I think is, I consulted it as part of this just to make sure my memory wasn't just exceptionally rosy or um, uh, just wrong in some way. So what have I learned? 
I've learned to stay focused on the horizon. We talk about big picture thinking, and most of us are in positions where we also have to do the day-to-day, -day, but to be able to keep that horizon in front of me has been important. The New York experience taught me, amongst others, taught me how important it is to pay attention when someone shares an opinion, even if they don't say it very loudly. The New York nurse practitioners did say it loudly. They hadn't had enough coffee. <laughs> but um, it was, it's important, I think, to address those issues. It also taught me to work together to develop new solutions that are often really much more creative than the original idea, and we did do a lot of that. Of that. And it taught me to forget the cart and the horse. Change is not sequential. Change processes just are not, and one has to keep moving forward. And finally, it taught me to stay the course and know when to stand firm and when to adjust. Now, at the national level, there's been a lot of conversation about the 2015 goal that AACN has had for moving all APRN education to the DNP level. And as you know, that has not happened. And so uh, within AACN, we've had conversations. What do we do about that? And we've decided that we stay the course. We keep aiming for the goal. We realize it's 2016. We, you know, that's obvious. But we stay the course. We keep working on it. And in response to some of the questions and concerns about that, the AACN Board of Directors commissioned the RAND Corporation to conduct a study of the barriers and facilitators for making this move. They did so. That report has been out for about a year and a half, I think, now. And as a consequence of the recommendations in that report, we convened um, a task force called the, with two of them actually, the APRN Clinical Task Force that published the APRN white paper with recommendations for clinical education models for APRNs, chaired by Lori lozon Claybo, who's now the dean at Wayne State University. That task force interestingly included Susan Stone, who might be here today, uh, president at Frontier Nursing Service. And the second task force that was a response to the RAND work was the DNP Implementation Task Force, Current Issues and Clarifying Recommendations. And again, the paper is out. That task force was chaired by Sarah Thompson, Dean at the University of Colorado uh, School of Nursing, and included Karen Stefaniak, who might be here today. And finally, we convened or we commissioned a report on the potential contributions of academic nursing to academic health centers and other types of health systems. And I brought a copy with me. It just came out. It's entitled Advancing Academic Healthcare Transformation, A New Era for Academic Nursing. And I'll share with you a little bit more about that in just a moment. So where are we now? Well, clearly you can see in the bar graphs on the left that we've had enormous growth in DNP programs. And one response to this might be, wow, look what has happened. That's a great response. That's something we enjoy thinking about. Uh, but another response is, well, how do we help all these programs? What kinds of tools and resources do we provide? How do we really make this work? That's enormous growth in just uh, less than a 10-year period of time. You can see the growth in the numbers of PhD programs, and those programs have grown as well. Not quite as, and well, clearly not as much, and in fact, there's, there have been questions raised about whether we even want that level of growth or whether we want to uh, continue to support and nourish, nurture the programs that we have, build in more funded research in those programs to give PhD students more opportunity to participate in funded research. So the programs are one thing, but looking at the enrollments is, tells another picture. Again, you can look at the DNP enrollments from 2005 to 2014. Uh, it's an enormous, explosive growth. We now have over 18,000 students enrolled in DNP programs. This tells us a lot, I think, about the potential for future clinical leadership in our nation, what might be possible. But we have to help those new graduates, and we have to think through the strategies related to program implementation. Uh, the PhD enrollments is, have increased as well, not as much, but almost 43%, a little over 42%, which is a very positive thing, but we need so much more nursing science that we need to do more uh, to attract nurses early in their career to careers in science. So uh, to get into just a tiny bit more depth on the Minot report on advancing healthcare transformation, I'd like to share with you a couple of the recommendations that pertain to, the, to this notion of 
uh, leadership in clinical practice, production and use of nursing science, integration of the two so that we have the full benefit from academic nursing. One of the recommendations is that uh, deans of nursing and faculty participate more in the clinical environment and understand the realities of our clinical partners, and similarly that we engage our clinical partners more in the academic environment. Another recommendation is directed a little bit more nationally, and it's substantial reinvestment in nursing research. The proportion of NIH dollars um, allocated to NINR is absolutely uh, tiny, and the, the authors of this report, who were not nurses and who did not have this history, were astounded by that. So the recommendations were based on a series of interviews with chief nursing executives, with deans of nursing, with deans of medicine, with hospitals presidents and CEOs, and with university chancellors and presidents. And it was our goal to engage all of those stakeholder groups in coming together to say, this is how we work with academic nursing to move those contributions forward. Subsequently, we had an invitational summit with representation from the same groups that I described, and then we followed that with um, interviews as well. The recommendations include embracing a new vision for academic nursing, enhancing the clinical practice of academic nursing, partnering in preparing nurses of the future and in the implementation of accountable care, investing in nursing research program and better, better integrating nursing research into the clinical practice, and nationally implementing an advocacy agenda to support this new era for academic nursing. So I'd like to close just by telling you a little bit about the school where I am right now, and of course I'm very proud of them, so I must, I must share a bit about what we're doing at the University of Nebraska Medical Center College of Nursing. The University of Nebraska Medical Center is one of four universities in the University of Nebraska system. We're based in Omaha on the east side of the state. We're in one of those rectangular states, and when I moved to Omaha, uh, people on the search, or when I was interviewing, people on the search committee said, Omaha is the staple in the Atlas book. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's really much more than that, but you know, it's a visual picture and gives you the idea. The College of Nursing is the only one of the six colleges within the University of Nebraska Medical Center, and actually the only one in the entire system, with multiple bricks and mortar campuses. And we have five campuses, as you can see in uh, Lincoln in Kearney in central Nebraska, Scotts Bluff on the west on the Wyoming border, and Norfolk. We like to say that we are a 500 mile wide campus and our whole university says that as well and it, and it is true and most of us travel it pretty regularly and I would say I do for sure. Um, just in brief, our enrollment in the College of Nursing is a little bit over a thousand uh, with um, the bulk of those students in undergraduate program and our master's program. Our DNP just shifted to BSN to DNP this past fall, and as we expand that program, we're contracting the APRN options in the master's program, and we plan to then um, shift to an advanced generalist in the master's program and uh, continue to uh, maintain those same numbers over time. And our PhD program normally has about 30 students and that will stay the same until we're actually expanding on the Lincoln campus and then we'll expand the um, PhD program at that point. We have uh, right now a little over 140 faculty members, most full time. We uh, employ graduate assistants pretty substantially across every, every one of the campuses to give our graduate students lots of good learning opportunities, and we have really wonderful staff. Our research areas focus more on symptom management, self-management, transitions, and health promotion than other topics. We have two research centers. The second one is just ready to go live. So the first is a named research center that was established, I think, about 40 years ago, and it's our infrastructure center. So the Neidfeld Nursing Research Center is where our associate dean for research, we have three statisticians, they all work together, our pre and post awards people, all of that is in the Neidfeld Nursing Research Center. But I'm very proud to share that we have managed to pull together the funding for a center for patient, family, and community engagement in chronic care management that I was delighted to know that our chancellor um, called me the day it was reviewed by the Board of Regents and he said that they unanimously approved it and they understood it. 
They understood the importance of this kind of research, so we are very excited about that. We do have active faculty practices across Nebraska, and we're fortunate that we have a mobile nursing van that we deploy um, in various places throughout the state that was purchased with stimulus money. And then we um, have continuing nursing education and very active student exchanges. So I just returned from China a few weeks ago, and this is a picture of an event that we were able to take the students. We, we had students in Xi'an, China at the time I was there, which was very nice. And we were able to take them to a cultural experience to see Tang Dynasty dancers. And so that's the photo of that. But we are uh, very eager to immerse our students in the, in the global world. So just to show you a picture of each division, we just opened a new building last August in the Kearney Division in central Nebraska that includes um, really wonderful active learning um, architecture and, uh, and equipment and technology. And we share the building with the College of Allied Health Professions, which is very exciting since that's new for us. We are building a new building in Lincoln, and this is the, these are hot off the press, the first architectural renderings of what it might look like, so we think it's beautiful, so I show it to every group I get to talk to. <laughs> and it is really very exciting for the Lincoln Division faculty and staff. We'll have research suites in this building, and one of our initiatives is to grow research in this building, or this um, division particularly. We opened the Northern Division in 2010, and we share this building, which was built uh, with philanthropic dollars, we share it with the associate degree program at Northeastern Community College, which is a really interesting partnership that works very well for us. And in Omaha, we opened the Center for Nursing Science building in 2010. So part of what I'm sharing with you is we've had in, we've been the beneficiaries of a lot of generosity from the legislators and private uh, donors. And so we try very hard, of course, to give back and show what we're doing. Our West Nebraska division is located also on a community college campus. This is the Harms building that was already there. And we moved in and we share that space with the associate degree program. And I have um, special academic equipment that I take with me when I visit <laughs> the um, campus in Scotts Bluff. It's on the Wyoming border. It's, it might be my favorite, but I don't, I don't say that. Anyway, to conclude, um, I'm a fan of reading Adam Bryant's corner office in the New York Times on Sunday. And this, this um, particular comment came from the column on January 29th. And this was from Liz Pierce, who's the CEO of a, a project management software company in, uh, called Liquid Planner. And she said, and this is what leadership feels like to me sometimes, I like to put all the pieces together. It's like a Rubik's Cube. When you're running a startup, you have this finite set of resources, and you have this huge goal. I might interject, in nursing, we're not startups, but we have a finite set of resources, and we have huge goals. So you look at all the angles, and you twist things this way and that, and you're thinking, what if we did it this way, and how could we do it better? So I think that we are all fortunate, and it's been my special privilege to share some thoughts with you today about the role of preparation and perception in seizing these opportunities. I thank you very much.